The video that you're about to watch is something that me and Devin wanted to make for Sexual Assault Awareness and Prevention Month. So because of that, it deals very heavily with sexual assault. If you feel like this is something that you might not be ready to hear or listen to, then that is perfectly fine. And your mental health matters more than watching this video. So please feel free to sit this one out. Throughout this video, you might see images of Devin wearing a dress. This is the dress that she wore on the night that she was assaulted. We at Ladylike decided to disable the comments for this video because we decided that the words that matter most in regards to this story are the ones that Devin is saying herself. But if you do feel like you need to talk to someone about this, please feel free to engage in the resources that we'll be sharing in the description as well as at the end of this video. Thank you so much for watching and for listening to Devin share her incredibly important story. Without further ado, here is Devin. Scene one, take one, A and B mark. All right. All right. So. So in the intro? Yeah. My name is Devin, and seven years ago on Saturday, my life took an unexpected turn. What point of your life were you in at that time? So seven years ago, I was working as a hostess and a nanny. I just moved to LA. I'd been here like maybe eight or nine months. Um, and I was doing the, the post-college dance that a lot of people do. The make all the money you can before the student loan bills come in um, and kind of just figure out how to settle into a new city. I just graduated from the University of Michigan, which is in Ann Arbor. Moving from Ann Arbor to LA was a bit of a culture shock, so I was still kind of grappling with this new big city. And I had just moved into a new apartment with some awesome roommates. It kind of felt like my life was starting, um, but I was happy, I was excited, I was super eager, possibly and definitely very naive about a lot of things. See, 2012, I was 23. I had just broken up with my boyfriend of five years. I was on the dating scene for the first time in a long time in a brand new city. And I didn't really know how to date just because I'm a direct communicator. <laughs> if I like somebody, I let them know and I tell them. Which like in the dating game, I mean that's that's one way to do things, but it definitely leaves you vulnerable if someone knows that you like them. So, if we could now sort of jump ahead to the night that night that all this happened. The night that my life changed. I have a friend in Los Angeles who was doing really well in Hollywood, he still is, and he's a wonderful human being, he's great, and he had this warehouse that he was renting because he was in a band, and he threw a warehouse party. And these parties were like my first encounter with like the Hollywood scene. They were catered, and they had bartenders there, and it was like open bar. I didn't have to pay for drinks. He's very gracious and a wonderful person, so I just felt very lucky to be in the mix. It was just kind of a, a fun night. It was, the, it was the night before Easter Sunday. And I was really nervous because again, I, didn't, I wasn't really into the Hollywood scene just yet. And so when I'm nervous, I, I really can't eat or drink. So I always remember just buzzing around, checking in with all of my friends, like babysitting maybe like a, a drink. I had a crush on my manager at work, um, at the restaurant I worked at. We'll just give him a fake name for now. Let's just call him Brock. I was trying to get Brock to come to the party. And Brock was kind of lukewarm about it. And I stayed at the party for about a couple hours. So then Brock was like, you know what, I'm probably not gonna come to the party, but you should come to me. But let me just add some context. The party was in Hollywood and where Brock lived was in Venice. Yeah, in LA, that's like, in L yeah, that's a long, that's, yeah. that's really far. It's far, it's far. Yeah. I was like, okay. Again, I didn't know anything about LA. And then also too, when you're in a new city, even if you have to travel a long way, it's exciting. The Devin of today would not have traveled from Hollywood to Venice for nobody. But I did, I got into my car, because again, I was very sober. But I had never been to his apartment before. I hadn't seen where he lived. And I remember walking down his street. I, I was excited, because I was like seeing someone I liked, life, you know? I'm starting to get those butterfly nerves just talking about it. I remember walking down his street, 
and seeing all these filming notices everywhere because they were shooting an episode of Californication. If I put myself back in that night, like I remember the excitement, I remember the nerves. Like you're driving to a guy that you like, his house at midnight and you can hear the waves and you can see these filming notices and it just feels very magical. <laughs> this is the start of something so great. For someone who's new to LA, it, I feel like that's exactly what you would imagine for LA to be. Yeah. And so it was like checking every single box. It was it. And this is, again, I hadn't dated for years. Mm -hmm. So it felt like, I don't know, like, yeah, dreamy. Like, this was it. In my mind, I imagined that I would go into his apartment and we would sip whiskey. We would talk about ourselves and have long conversations and then like maybe make out. That's what I was expecting. I even walked up his back stairs, I remember, because he didn't come to the door. You know in an apartment building situation, especially his old apartments, you, um, someone has to let you in? He didn't come to the door, which should have tipped me off. He was like, go up the back stairs and it'll be open. Also, I should have been tipped off because I remember the text messages were like super choppy and super misspelled but again like I didn't know then you wanted to believe something else yeah you know yeah. you wanted something else to happen you you already had it developed in your brain of what the night was going to look like and so when you already have that image and you're getting pieces that are not crazy but they might be a little bit off but they still fit into that image mm -hmm. then your scene is still just ready to go right right it just went straight over my head. Mm -hmm. um, so then I specifically remember the moment that he opened his apartment door um, because I knocked and I, uh, he opened the door and I was like, oh, not even crestfallen, not even really disappointed, but this man was super drunk. He was like so far gone. I was like, oh, that's why you wanted me to come to you. Immediately, I switched into, oh, I'm gonna put, I'm gonna get him some water. Maybe we'll chat if I can get a sentence in. I'm gonna put him to bed and then we'll laugh about this later. And I remember walking into his apartment and it was filthy. <laughs> like there were clothes everywhere and uh, dirty dishes. And I was looking into the living space of now I know someone who is not well. Because like there are messy people and then there are people who live in mess because they're not mentally okay. Um, and that's what I felt like I was entering to. And again, I, I should have been tipped off by that, but I, I was just like, okay. <laughs> and he was stumbling around the studio apartment. I went into his kitchen and I washed two glasses, a glass of water for him, and then I made myself, because he had like a bottle of whiskey that was all almost drained, and so I gave myself a little whiskey, and I was like, okay, well, I might as well have a little sip of something. I'm gonna watch you drink this water. I opened his fridge, there was nothing in it, and I remember when I opened his fridge, he was like, are you looking for booze? And then he opened up his closet in his studio apartment, and it was filled top to bottom with whiskey. Like if I walked into this situation now, I would be like, wow, this person is, um, needs help, you know? And I didn't, I didn't think that at the time. I don't know how you want to go into this part. Um, from there, uh, from there I, started to drink uh, a little whiskey and he started to drink a little water, although it was kind of like, you know when drunk people drink water, they're like, Ugh. me being me, I started to make fun of him because I was like, come on, like you're missing your mouth. Like again, I thought I was putting a drunk friend to bed. So it's just kind of lightly teasing, like, ah, come on, man. Like, let's, let's put you, let's, let's get you to bed. Let's, um, let's take care of this. Like, you're obviously not okay. Um, and then it, it got, uh, and then it got bad because he didn't like that I was teasing him. And that's when it turned 
Yeah, and uh, so then I, uh, well, you guys can gather what happened next. The one thing I remember about the act itself, um, because I completely disassociated, I left my body for most of it, um, but this man, Brock, was, is 6'3", six, 6'4", six, really built, um, and he held me down by my neck. Um, and it took me a long time to wear chokers again after that. Now, they were like one of my favorite accessories because of it. But like for a long time, I couldn't have um, like anything tight around my neck because it would just bring me back to that place. What I do remember is he fell asleep straight up on top of me. And I just remember lying there being like, where am I? What just happened? Like, did I ask for this? I was still wearing my dress for the most part. I mean, like it was in the bed, but like, you know, when it's still like kind of on you, it was still very much on. And uh, <laughs> I didn't sleep at all that night. I didn't really even move which I know if we were to bring any of this situation into a court, court of law, that makes me look more culpable. Um, it makes me look more like guilty and like I asked for it because I didn't leave afterwards. But it was actually very hard for him. It was hard for me to move. It was hard for me to get out from underneath. After he had decided that he was finished, <laughs> what did you do? I was thinking about like, I have to get plan B tomorrow. I was thinking about what would happen, like, what does this mean? I remember even having the thought, does this mean he likes me? <laughs> because 23-year-old Devin in that moment was just trying to process, was just trying to put the pieces together, how she knew how, like, with what she had, you know? And I equated sex with you liking somebody. I felt like something broke in me, but it wasn't like emotional breaking. Like I wasn't, I didn't have any really big emotions just yet. I just remember being like, now I'm different. <laughs> this is big. I don't know how, but now I'm different. Um, I always kind of thought of myself as a fighter. I mean, everyone on Ladylike will tell you that I'm the first one to engage in conflict if I don't like something. But I just remember it, it took a long time for me to even extract myself from that situation, even to like get out of his bed, untangle myself, put my clothes back on. I like woke him up and of course that didn't really work, but I told him I was leaving and he was like, <laughs> And so I left, I put my shoes on, and I remember hearing church bells as I was walking to my car, and I realized it was Easter Sunday. I grew up very Catholic. I went to an evangelical Christian school in the South, and I just felt like God's eyes were on me, that I was being watched and judged as I was walking to my car, and that's when it hit me. What had happened? I told my roommate at the time, who, by the way, like this is nothing against my roommate at the time. I really do like her and um, the dialectic, meaning that there can be two things at once, is that she was just responding to the situation the best she knew how. And I feel like if I were to come to this person with the same situation today, she would respond differently. But she was the first person I told because she was my roommate and she was there. And uh, she said to me, oh, was it one of those situations where it was easier just to say yes and get it over with? And I said, yeah, 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 that's it, that's it. And she was like, that's not right. I mean, like, that's just college. When you first shared your story with your roommate at the time, she didn't react in a way that was helpful to you. Mm -mm. What would have been something that she could have said or done that would have made you feel like you weren't alone? The first thing that you have to do is validation. Validate, validate, validate. Yes, this happened to you. 
yes, you're having feelings and you have to have feelings. You're right. I'm not crazy that I didn't do this to myself, that um, what I'm feeling and how confused I am is okay. Everyone copes with things differently. Some people need softness, some people need distraction, some people need fill in the blanks, but everybody needs to be validated because no one told me that I needed to take time to process. I, I think I had all these feelings come up and all of these thoughts and cognitions that were causing me stress and anxiety, and no one said, no, that's fine, that's good. And I just kind of walked around my apartment all day being like mad, I was mad, you know? Um, so I called him, because I knew him, I worked with him. And I was like, hey, and he was like, hi. I was like, do you want to talk about last night? And he was like, what? What about last night? And it became clear to me that he didn't remember. And I was like, you need to get your ass over to my house right now. Um, you need to come over. He came over to my apartment that day, that afternoon, before his shift at work. And he stood in my kitchen, and I basically cried, yelled at him for like 30 minutes about what happened. And he did, he listened and he apologized. He said that he had no memory, no recollection of even me coming and showing up. He didn't remember what I was wearing. He didn't remember that I was there. He didn't remember what he did. He didn't remember anything. And I was like, I woke you up that morning. I woke you up this morning. You don't remember? And he said, no. So I don't know if that is him just protecting himself or if that's true, but that's what he claims. So when he was in my kitchen and I was yelling at him, I remember being like, I liked you. I came over to your house because I liked you. And he asked me out on a date. <laughs> then and there in my kitchen. And I said, yes. We did date off and on for a couple weeks afterwards. Um, and I think that was me trying to make sense of what happened. I think that was me trying to regain control because if we're dating, then it's not assault. Then it's just whatever. Of course, that's not true and I know that, but that was my logic back then. And for a long time afterwards, I thought to myself that like, okay, there, I did it. It is done. I confronted him. He said he was sorry. What else can we do? Like, I don't really want to press charges. Um, it is what it is. And I think I did that because I was so afraid of becoming a victim. Afterwards, I like just really wanted, I wanted my life to be back the way it was. And it's taken me seven years to realize that after something like this happens to you, after someone takes your autonomy away, even if it's for a minute, you're not the same afterwards. You're just not. And this is the part that I'm the most mad and ashamed of. He made me into a victim, and I didn't want to be a victim. So how did, how was your life different before and after this all happened? After this situation with Brock, I dated a man who was completely aggressive, broke my window, broke my printer, he was toxic, uh, emotionally abusive, but I thought that was like normal? I don't know. I was isolating. I would completely isolated myself. I isolated myself from my friends. I isolated myself from my identity. And I just developed these weird habits and things, these weird little reckless behaviors as a way to cope because I didn't know what else to do. I would go on OkCupid okay and I would just like meet men go out and have dinner or drinks with them and then never talk to them again. Again, me trying to find some kind of sense of control. I would pile on everything, like all activities would not slow down and then eventually just have a meltdown. Like all these like weird little coping mechanisms I developed. It took a while for me to start to identify each one and undo it, you know? It took years, years of work. Why do you think you didn't want to slow down? Because if I slowed down, 
then I would have to confront these feelings. Because I think the entire time I doubted that it actually happened. Because I injected myself into that situation, I really blamed myself for a long time, which I think a lot of people do after something like this happens. And I think that is our sense of trying to regain control. I can't blame the other person because I can't make that other person take in the blame and the responsibility, but I can blame myself. And that's what I did. It's like, regardless of what you're wearing or what you asked for, he should not have done that. No, no, and like- And that's it, you know? I was raised and I was socialized to always trust the judgment of men and to always question my own. And that has taken years to undo. I'm still undoing it. On that night, the Saturday before Easter, I decided to wear this red dress that is a fire engine red. Um, I got it because it reminded me of Joan from Mad Men. And I wanted to make a little bit of a statement but not be too out there. You know, like I remember feeling like curvy and sexy and I loved the way it, it hit me in the right spot on my, on my waist. I just loved the way it hugged me. It felt like this dress was made for me. I'm different now. I have a different job. I have a different living situation. I make different money. I live in a different apartment. I'm different. However, 23-year-old Devin is still a part of me. And for a long time, I blamed her. And I wasn't nice to her. And I want to wear that dress because 23-year-old Devin and I can still agree on the fact that that's a good dress and we like it. And I want to reclaim that dress because I want to reclaim her. Because I was so mean to her. And if I met a 23-year-old version of myself on the street, I would not be as mean. And I think that's why I want to reclaim it. Because I don't think you should be mean to yourself after something like this happens to you. It's not your fault. It wasn't her fault. <sighs> and I think what, what it, whatever it is you're struggling with, a situation like this, or something equally as traumatic, that version of yourself is still a part of you. And being mean to it isn't helping the situation. Accepting that this person helped get you to where you are today and that she needs to be honored. That's why I'm wearing the dress. Um, so I put on this dress because it made me feel like I got this. And I'm gonna wear this dress again because I wanna feel that way again. There is a happy, a semi-happy part of the story that I've left out. Mm -hmm. Three or four years later, after my assault, I'm out with a girlfriend. And she's like, I met, also met a guy. I met a guy at one of these bars. I was like, ooh, intrigue. Tell me about him. She's like, well, he's tall, built like a Grecian god. And his name is Brock. And I was like, oh, funny. How did you meet him? And she was like, well, he was the bartender. What restaurant? But yeah, I sat her down afterwards and was like, you should not go out with him. He did this to me a couple years ago. Um, I'm not denying that Brock might be different now. He might have turned a new leaf. He may have done some self work. He may be in therapy, God bless him. But like, he doesn't deserve to date my friend. And so she didn't, she dumped him. Telling your story and putting that dress on, that's a lot. It is a lot. And I think sometimes we shy away from stuff because they're a lot. I think we use that moniker of being a lot to not talk about things. 
It's just a lot. I feel too much. It's heavy. Yeah, <laughs> it is. But you gotta name it to tame it. And that's just the fact of life. If we're ever going to address rape culture in America and the world, we gotta talk about our relationship to being a lot. So yeah, it's a lot. But it is what it is. I'm not going anywhere. I live in this world, I exist. And this is my story, and I didn't want to share it for a long time. But you hearing about my a lot may help you deal with your a lot. This is something that you shied away from talking about for a long time. Mm -hmm. What is making you want to talk about it today? Oh, we have to keep this conversation going because if we don't, then we're just gonna regress backwards. I'm in a place in my life where I can afford therapy. I'm in a place in my life where I have friends who can support me, networks of people who love me and who can be with me. And yes, this is hard. And yes, I'm scared for this to go live. But I know I'm gonna be okay at the end of the day. There are a lot of people out there who don't have these means, who don't know if they came out that they're gonna be okay. And watching this video, I hope people realize that they're not alone and that I'm still fighting this fight. I'm not going anywhere. A lot of us have suffered situations like this before. A lot of us are being really mean to ourselves because this has happened and that if, you, if you're watching this and this has happened to you, you maybe take a step back. Just be kinder to yourself. That's it. Be kinder to yourself. It makes it easier. It makes it so much easier. <laughs> this video is landing on a channel called Ladylike, and I know it can be perceived as a ladies issue, as a thing only for, that affects women. It affects us all. Assault happens to everyone, not just women, not just female-bodied people. And it affects us as a human race. <laughs> to any man or person who might be watching this who has committed an assault, we get better. We get stronger. What are you doing? How are you changing? How are you standing up for us? How are you rectifying the situation? Because you can't change the past, but you can change the future. So even though this is on Ladylike, and we are ladies talking about lady things, it's not a ladies issue. It's an every goddamn person issue. Can I give you a hug before we cut? <laughs> I'm proud of you, Dad. <laughs> Thank you. You're strong, baby. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Should I go eat lunch? Yeah, let's eat lunch. <laughs> That's good.